What's going on everybody? Johnny Bannon here with Trepid Technologies. If you're enjoying the content, please like, subscribe, share with your friends, and let's go over domain 3.4 of our Network Plus full video course, Network Services. So in today's video lesson, we're going to touch on DHCP and then time protocols. So we have two major time protocols, NTP and PTP, and then also the secure version of NTP. Then we're also going to touch on an IPv6 automatic or uh, dynamic way to assign addressing called Slack. So let's go ahead and get started. I'm going to get my face out of the way here. That's not important for us to learn DHCP. And okay, as so you see our, our objectives here. In this video, we're going to go over the objectives on the left. In the next video, we'll touch on DNS and name resolution because that I want that to be a video entirely on its own. So DHCP, well, what is it? So a dynamic host control protocol. This is used to dynamically assign IP addresses and other network configuration parameters for devices or what we call clients. Essentially what this is is a way for us to dynamically assign IP addressing so that our infrastructure can talk to each other, specifically our clients. Think uh, phones, computers, maybe printers, right? In some scenarios, we're going to be using DHCP for them. And imagine, you know, what's the reason? What's the why behind DHCP? Well, imagine we have a mid-sized enterprise of 300 different people, all in their own VLANs, different subnets, and we had to go manually assign IP addressing. So we had to go into like our Windows machine, go to like control panel, local area connections, and type in an IP address, the subnet mask, the default gateway, the DNS servers we want to use to every single computer, and then managing that and making sure we don't have any IP address overlap or any... Uh, conflicts ip address conflicts it just wouldn't be feasible and it hasn't been feasible since i mean probably the early 2000s late 90s mid 90s we've been using dhcp okay so dhcp for ipv4 specifically is a standard for assigning and allocating ip addressing to client devices now i made that designation ipv4 that is the standard well, because in IPv6, we have something called Slack, we have the EUI64 format, we have linked local addresses, and then we also have DHCP version 6 for IPv6 as well. But when we're talking DHCP and you talk to net engineers, system admins managing DHCP, most of the time we're talking IPv4. So DHCP servers, where do they sit? So one, they can sit on-premise or off-premise, we'll go over that, but they can live in your router or you can have a dedicated server in its own VM, like a Windows Server 2022 VM, and the only service running on there could be DHCP. Depending on your environment is going to dictate what kind of scenario you're going to deploy. If we're talking a small to mid-sized office building, like for example, where I'm located at the Trepid Technologies office, at most, at most, we're going to have maybe 50 IP addresses allocated for my 40 computers and my TVs, a couple printers, and then uh well cell phones right if i have a each student has a cell phone so maybe a hundred well would i want to dedicate the time the money the funds to deploy my own dedicated dhp server so i gotta go buy the hardware maybe deploy a6i on that uh spin up a windows server machine and then deploy the dhp service and manage that probably not what i'm gonna want to do is just let dhp be managed at my router and let that integrated service router as you know do the routing and also do that DCP function. And that's going to be on-prem. Now, I could also have a dedicated server on-prem as well. But I could have a DCP server that sits in a data center. And if I'm in a big global enterprise with a spoke site of like 50 to 100 users, I could do something called DCP relay where all the systems and clients in that spoke will actually get their DHCP addressing from our data center that's hosting a DHCP server. We'll go into that as well. Okay, so the operation of DHCP, how does it work? So again, when we set up a client, the first thing is the client's going to send a broadcast message out saying, I need IP info. The DHCP server is going to receive that quest and then respond to the client. And this entire process, we describe it in an acronym called DORA. It's a four-step thing, DHCP where we have the discover, that's a client message sending a discover broadcast over UDP saying, I need IP addressing. It's a broadcast, so it's going to go to everything on that network. The DHCP server is going to hear that, and it's going to send back an offer, and this is going to be a unicast message, okay? Straight back to the client. And then we have a request, 
This is also going to be from the client, and that's going to be a broadcast UDP message. DHCP server is going to listen to that. It's going to hear it. And it's going to send back an acknowledgement via unicast back to that client, and then we're going to deliver the IP addressing that it needs. Here's the, DH, uh, the door process, a nice little image. Uh, you can see DHCP messages sent from the client use UDP source port 68 and destination port 67, and then it's the reverse for the server. So DHCP messages sent from the server to the client use UDP source port 67 and destination port 68. Okay, DHCP options. So beyond just IP addressing. So we know that to at minimum to talk on your local area network, a client device needs an IP address, it needs its proper subnet mask, and it needs a default gateway to talk in the network. Well, default gateway to talk out of the network, but anyways, that's the basic things. Well, what else does the device may need? They may need DNS information because you don't want to manually set that. If you're already giving away the IP addressing dynamically with a DHCP server, the DNS information as well. We need that to communicate on the internet to do that hosting resolution, which we'll dive deeper into in the next video. We also may need other options. Maybe we want to image computers over the LAN. So we set up a Windows deployment service, a pre-execution environment. Maybe we're using SCCM to do this. And when we plug in computers into the wall jack, and they're going to send out the DHCP request, and we want to do a re-image over the wire, over the LAN, our DHCP server is going to have to have options on there. Option 66, 67 is one example where we tell that device, here's where you point to to go get your image. Here's the where the IP address is, or here's where the file share is to actually go get that image, to pull that image down so you can re-image over the wire. Another example, this is our VoIP phones. So I've worked in Cisco environments, so that's the example I'm going to use. A Cisco VoIP phone needs to request its configuration via TFTP from a call manager or a CUCM, call, uh, Cisco Unified Call Manager. To get that call manager's IP address, the DHCP server would need an option 150 IP address. That when that phone reaches out for its DHCP addressing, in that DHCP request packet, is going to be something that says, hey, uh, I, I need this, right? And the DHCP server is going to say, oh, cool. I can give you that TFTP IP address, really that call manager IP address, because I configured option 150 here. Now, when you do, uh, when you set up DHCP servers, like on a Windows server, the default gateway, the DNS information are also considered options, right? Another component of D, or actually, don't want to get ahead of myself, DHCP relay. So I talked about a DHCP server can sit outside the WAN, and it can. So let's take a step back. So the DHCP operations, the process, that's an acronym called DORA, where a client is the D and the R of that acronym. So a client's going to send a discover message. That discover message is a broadcast. A broadcast can only be sent within a LAN, within a broadcast domain. So if I have a DHCP server sitting outside the local area network, beyond this site, or just honestly in an entirely different subnet, right? Not within that broadcast domain. When this user here sends that DHCP discover message, that's a broadcast, what's going to happen? It's, there's no server there to respond because that broadcast doesn't leave the local area network. So what we can do is set up DHCP relay where we tell the default gateway, whatever that is, hey, if you receive broadcast messages from the clients, and in that destination field of that broadcast is an IP address that sits outside our LAN. Forward it. Forward that packet via unicast to that destination IP. So DHCP relays exactly what it says. It's going to relay that discover and request messages from the clients to that distant DHCP server via unicast. When the DHCP server responds, it's going to respond directly back to that client unicast well really it'll go it's a relay right it'll respond back via unicast which is by default the nature of dhp server messages anyways the offer and acknowledgements are unicast so in a cisco ios environment to configure the dhp relay we put the ip helper address command some other components of dhp reservations so dhp reservations allow administrators to assign a specific ip address to a particular device and this will be based off the MAC address. So what we're saying here is that maybe there's uh, clients, uh, devices in our network 
that are receiving IP address information that cannot change. Because with DHCP, there's a lease. So DHCP will lease out an IP address. Whatever you set will get there. It's that third bolt there for seven days. Then after those seven days, it's possible that that client could get a new IP address. So if we have a printer that is going to be part of the, we're going to put it on a print server, make it like a domain asset. If we have a VTC machine that is going to need a IP address that stays consistent because we're configuring it in our UCS or, or our Cisco Unified Collaboration System, whatever the case may be. If we have to set a static IP address up on one of our devices, for whatever the reason is, we want to go ahead and make that reservation in our server so that our DHCP server knows, hey, do not try to assign this IP address out to any client. We need to reserve it. This IP address belongs to this MAC address, okay? And in those scenarios like a local file share, a NAS, a printer, a VTC machine, that's when you'd want to do that. A scope, that's just the range. Uh, after this slide, I'm going to do some configuration, a little example of DHCP configuration on a Cisco device. That's just saying, hey, uh, I need to make a DHCP pool for a slash 27. That's my scope. So my scope will be 192.168.00 slash 27. So that means it's dot zero to dot 31. And technically dot one to dot 30, right? Usable IP addresses. That's just a scope, okay? Now, this vocabulary, the DHCP scope, is important because like on a DHCP server, Windows server, it'll actually say that, like what's the scope? We'll make a pool, give it a name, say what's the scope, and then you give it the IP address range that you're going to be assigning from that DHCP server. Then the lease time. So DHCP leases IP addresses for a specific period known as the lease time, and then once that lease time expires, the device is going to have to renew it, right? We're going to have to get a new IP address. Okay, last thing we'll talk about, and then we'll go into some DHCP examples, is Slack. That's the stateless address auto configuration. This is used for IPv6. It does kind of replace DHCP, but then we also have a DHCP solution for IPv6 if we need more advanced things like all those options and things like that. Um, but the way it works essentially is Slack relies on the device generating its own address based on the network prefix. So what's going to happen here, if I have this configured, where I say auto configuration, this host is going to send to the multicast address of IPv6. It's like FF02. Um, and say, hey, I need uh, addressing. The IPv6 router is going to reply via ICMP v6. It's going to use the Internet Control Message Protocol version 6. And say, hey, device, here's our network prefix. Now go ahead and create your own IP address based off that. Okay? So two key components. The network prefix. The router advertises the network prefix. The first part of the IPv6 address to devices on the network. And then the device generates the second part of the IPv6 address based on its MAC address or a random value, okay? So this allows devices to configure their own IPv6 addresses autonomously, providing greater flexibility and eliminating the need for a DHCP server. But DHCP version 6 can still be used for more advanced configurations when necessary. Kind of those, you know, probably huge environments, you may need that, right? And we had to put those different options. Okay, before we move on to the timing protocols, let's go ahead and do some lab work. Okay, so we're at our lab here. So what I'm going to do here is just show you what we got going on. Let me get my face out of the way. So we have R1 here. That's the DHCP server. Um, this Cisco iOS device. So I'm going to show you how to create the pool, set the scope, do some of the options, lease, right, how to add DNS to it. And then at PC3, we'll do a door request and see our IP address and get... Um, get assigned to us, and then I'll show you how to do uh, reservations on a Cisco iOS. More accurately, I'm going to show you how to do exclusions. So I'm going to show you how to say, hey, these 10 IP addresses, we don't want part of the pool to be assigned out to users. So let's go ahead and get started here. I'm going to, I was doing some testing before the lecture started. What I'm going to do here is get rid of any DCP uh configuration I currently have on the router so I'm going to get rid of this DHCP pool here just by putting the no command and then I'm going to check to make sure that my default gateway is configured it should be gig 00 and then this is going to be our scope essentially right 192.168.00 slash 24 so let's go ahead and make our pool so it's going to be IP DHCP pool net plus I'm going to set our this is setting our scope it's setting the network address telling this pool net plus you know, what is 
what its range is, what IP address you're going to be able to assign, and what the network address is, where it's starting. Then I got to set the default gateway, right? I got to say, hey, when you assign IP addressing to these users, that's the default gateway. Because the default gateway technically doesn't have to be dot one. It could be like dot two five four, the last IP address in the range. Next, let's set a lease time. So you can see we can set the lease in days here. I'll just put it to seven, but you can make it whatever you want. And then we're going to set up a primary and secondary DNS server IP address for the user. So the primary can be all nines and then all 88.8.8. .8 awesome. And then let's do an option. So let's say we had some Cisco VoIP phones in here and we need to tell them where to go do their TTP connections to get their phone profiles from a primary or secondary call manager. We can do that as well. All right. And now if we take a look at our configuration and our running config, we can see we set up the scope, we set up all of our options here, and the lease time. Now if we want to do an exclusion, so let's say I wanted dot .50 to dot .70 to be used for static IP addresses in case we got printers, VTC machines, uh, what else, uh, uh, local file shares like a NAS, we need static IPs for that, a part of this subnet, but we don't want the DTP pool to assign them. We can do this from global config. IP DHP excluded address 192.168.0.50. And if I wanted 20 here, right, I could do 192.68.0.69. Okay. And that would be 20 IP addresses excluded from that pool. So now if we end here, show IP DHCP pool, we can see the IP address range. Let's see here. All right. Now let's go to our PC, and what we're going to do is type in IP DHCP. These are just like little virtualized PCs in our EVNG emulation software. And you can see it's, it's kind of telling, it's kind of cool, like it's doing Dora. And we got an IP address assigned. If we come back to the router here, redo that command, we can see we have one least address. We could do pool bindings, do show IP DHCP bindings. And we can actually see the hardware address that's associated with that IP address. Another thing we can do here is from the PC, let's do show IP. And we can see everything that got assigned to us, our DNS, our DHCP server. So pretty cool, guys. Uh, that's a quick example of DHCP. One last thing, if you need to set up DHCP relay, like let's say our, DNS serv our DHCP server sat outside of our network here and... Uh, we had to, our users had to reach it and it's at, we're in Chandler, Arizona, our data center is in like New York, okay, where our DHCP server lives. You would come to the default gateway interface, whatever that is, and you would type in IP helper address and then whatever the DHCP server was. And that's how we set up DHCP relay at our default gateway or whatever device is going to be forwarding those discovery messages from the clients. All right, so that's a little DHCP. I'm going to pause the video, and let's go ahead and get back to the lecture and finish up going over NTP. All right, so let's go ahead and go over our timing protocols now. We're going to start off by going over NTP. Now, the importance of synchronizing timing in an environment, it's, it's pretty deep. And what I, see, what I mean by that is there's so many different protocols that are reliant on time synchronization. Example off the top of my head is Kerberos, right? Uh, that needs to have correct timing for that ticket grading ticket service uh, in a Active Directory domain. For the network, if we have a big global enterprise, bunch of WAN connections everywhere, we got uh, routers making IPsec, GRE connections, sending uh, OSPF for your GRP WAN keys over that wire from all over the country or globally, right? I got a router in Germany that has an ERGP neighbor or an OSPF neighbor with a router in Raleigh, North Carolina through a GRE IPsec tunnel, whatever VPN you have, but we want to make sure that we have WAN keys. Those WAN keys can have uh, lease times on it, where we say, hey, this WAN key between OSPF neighbors or EOGRP neighbors is only available from March 1st to October 1st, 2024. And then we roll those keys over every six months or every nine months, whatever the case may be. Well, if the timing's wrong on those routers, those WAN keys are going to say, hey, no, I don't trust you because you may be not part of that accurate time. 
So timing's important for a lot of different scenarios on the network. It's an important network service that may be overlooked, um, but it's needed, okay? So NTP, the network time protocol. This is a widely used protocol designed to synchronize clocks of computers over a network. This is used a lot in IT environments, kind of almost the standard, I would say, what I've seen the most being used. And it's hierarchical. So it has stratum levels, with stratum zero being the most accurate, that atomic timing, typically where an NTP master server would live. It would be stratum zero or maybe stratum one as your primary. And then every single hop after that is going to go down a stratum level and be considered less accurate, okay? NTS, the network time security. This is just an extension NTP that provides security features. So it uses TLS, right? It's just going to say, hey, instead of, NTP coming over, well, uh, open and over port 123, which NTP uses, we're going to add TLS on top of that transmission to protect it, right? So we can encrypt that data payload or those, you know, those headers. Then the last one we're going to talk about is PTP. It does the same thing as NTP at a higher precision. And this is going to be used a lot in like OT environments, industrial control systems. Why is it not used in networking as much? I I honestly couldn't tell you. Maybe I should have done a little bit more research. I just know from my experience, I've used NTP. I've set up PTP2 in a lab environment. Um, a little bit more complicated, but at the end of the day, they're doing the same thing. They're synchronizing timing. Uh, but in PTP, you need microsecond or nanosecond level accuracy, financial trading, telecommunications, and industrial automation, where... Uh, NTP will maybe be milliseconds in timing. And you can see that even on like your network devices, you do show NTP associations. It's milliseconds of timing, okay? PTP works by exchanging synchronization messages between a master clock and slave clocks. All right, now let's go ahead and do our quiz. Okay, so we're at our learning management system here. Let's go ahead and go to our Network Plus course. We're going to come to Lessons here. We're going to scroll down to domain 3.4.1 and let's go ahead and take our domain quiz. Let me zoom in, zoom in here. Okay, question one. How does network time security enhance the security of the network time protocol? TLS, right? Just learn that. Easy day. Question two. Which of the following is a characteristic of precision time protocol that differentiates it from NTP? It's that timing, right? It synchronizes devices with nanosecond or microsecond precision used in OT operational uh, technologies. It describes industrial stuff, right? IT versus OT. Okay, which protocol is used to synchronize clocks on computers and other devices over a network with millisecond level precision? That's the network timing protocol. I mean, technically NTS too, right? But anyways, that's just an extension of NTP. So more accurately, NTP does that. Question four, which of the following is the primary role of DHCP in a network? That's assigning IP addresses, right? That's what it's mainly there for. We have other advanced features it can do to help us out, but that's it, assign IP addressing. Question five, what is the function of a DHCP relay agent often referred to as an IP helper? It's going to forward DHCP messages between clients and servers located on different subnets, and that's because, right, the discover message is UDP broadcast. Question six. Which of the following best describes stateless address auto configuration? Not manually. Not a server. So this is a mechanism that allows IPv6 devices to configure their own addresses without a DHCP server. All right. Look at us. We got 100%. Awesome. So I want to thank you all for viewing. Uh, like, subscribe, share with your friends. And if you're interested in getting access to our learning management system, hit that link description below. Hit, a, hit our team up if you want to come to our actual live virtual training where we get vouchers, more CompTIA exclusive material sent to you. Hit that link description. Reach out to us. I'll see you in the next video.